Um, my name is Barry Cranford. So I was the founder of the LJC back in 2007. Uh, also run RepWorks, which is a recruitment company, um, a tech recruitment company. We do a lot more than just recruitment. So we do, uh, we do all the events and things like the LJC, but we do loads of other stuff to do with like mentoring, um, helping you become a CTO or get up on stage and speaking, things like this. Um, if anyone wants to hear any more about it, um, there's a link. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's a link where you can read about what we do, why we do it, and all that kind of thing. So it's there if you want to go and find it um, or come and talk to me and ask me about it afterwards. That's absolutely fine. Um, but other than that, I think we are going to kick off. We should be ready to go. Um, so our first speaker, uh, and it's in fact, Rachel, your first time with the LJC entirely, isn't it? So Rachel's our first speaker. So Rachel, whenever you're ready, feel free to, to share and, and, and kick things off. Oh, right. Great. Thanks, Barry. Um, yep. Let me just get this um, shared. Okay. Yep. That should be us up there. So um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel. As um, Barry's just said, this is my um, first time doing a talk at London Java community. So uh, thank you for, for having me. I discovered this group a few weeks ago and um, have been enjoying listening to the lightning talk. So thought I would um, give it a go. Um, can everyone see the full screen okay? Is, is the video covered at the right hand side? No, nope, we're good. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking today about onboarding and poor pair programming during a pandemic. Uh, at least I would be if my mouse was working. Oh no. Sorry, I'm going to try that again this was working just a few seconds ago it's always the way isn't it zoom is just <laughs> horrible especially to to yeah new, new speakers zoom, zoom hates it uh, the arrow oh. keys can work sometimes if, if the mouse will, will disappear okay um and if, if all this fails i'll just keep it in presentation mode okay that seems to be working now okay so yeah my uh, quick intro is that i'm currently working as a java product engineer at esri up in edinburgh um, I've recently completed a two-year graduate program there, and um, this is because my past is um, not in technology, but I changed careers um, a few years ago. So prior to working for Esri, I worked as a geologist and then wanted to change up careers and so embarked in a 16-week um, intensive coding boot camp called CodeClan up in Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty new to the to the tech scene. And today I um, just wanted to quickly share um, some of the experiences that I've recently had um, with being involved with onboarding some some new staff, um, the experiences I had with that, and some of the lessons that I learned. So um, last year, the situation over summer 2020, we hired two new graduates, which was amazing to be able to do during a pandemic. One of them had recently also changed careers and um, the other had finished up at or was going to be finishing up at university soon. And both of those are experiences that I remember really well, especially with having changed careers so recently myself. I find myself feeling um, quite responsible for ensuring that both of them had a, a really good and positive onboarding experience, uh, particularly during a pandemic when there's other challenges to get over. And I thought I had the opportunity to make a, a difference here. So yeah, my thoughts were that this is a really nice chance to change up some company culture that we have here, um, especially during a pandemic and working remotely. This is all things that we're all new to. Um, I'm sure everyone watching is in, is in the same boat, but I recognize that we're not in the office and that um, removes some opportunities to be able for for new starts to be able to turn around and say, hey, Rachel, um, what's going on with this code? Or, hey, I remember of the team, what's going on here? So needed to create an open environment to encourage this kind of discussions and learning. Um, and also recognize that we didn't want to just lean on um, technical chat. So chatting over Slack or over GitHub, that's all text based and that can be open to miscommunication and misinterpretation. So really wanted to increase face-to-face -face, um, contact there. So I had these thoughts um, 
and I wanted to get involved. So I took the initiative to volunteer to mentor our two new hires. And um, this felt really natural to do because they would both be following the same graduate path as I did. Um, I would be able to accelerate their learning, joining on our, our samples team. Um, and I could do that based on the past experience of what I'd learned and what I recognized could be improved. Um, for me, this is quite a big step because I was new to mentoring, especially when it comes to explaining technical terms and, and using Java. Um, but I recognize this is a good opportunity for, for growth. So um, initially before they joined, I set up a reference guide for how to set up new samples um, so that they would have a guide to be able to refer to when they joined if I wasn't around for any chats. And even just setting this up um, really helped at a personal level. It allowed me to look back at how much I'd learned um, over the last year and a half or, or so. Oh no, here we go again. I can't change the arrow. It seems to be whenever somebody joins. Okay, but it's all fine. We're working with the mouse click now. Um, okay, so um, I, in practice then, um, what we would do is um, our new grads would submit their um, code for PR over GitHub. I would review and um, take a look for any kind of um, places that there could be room for improvement. So looking for examples of repeated code, um, making sure that we are being consistent with our samples template, um, all the things that I remember being pulled up for when I first joined, um, along with some of the additional things I'd learned going through the graduate scheme myself. I would add these review comments to the PR for later discussion, and this would allow them to be able to have a chance to look over um, my comments, first of all, to then prepare for a later person to person discussion. We would then actually hold a um, trio programming session. So it was myself and both of the grads and they would take it in turns to um, share the code that they had written. I would then talk through some of the room for improvement and then um, I would ask them to share their screen, get them to drive the code and then start to um, implement some of the suggestions that I'd made. And this is really great. This opened up a good discussion panel, allowed there to be room and space for questions, um, and we could work it out together. And yeah, there's just a little example photograph at the bottom here about um, some of the user experiences and UIs that we wanted to discuss. So it wasn't just code we were looking at, but also user experience. So um, the outcomes, what did we learn from a, from a team perspective? Um, this is a great experience because we all learned. Um, it wasn't just the new grads learning about coding and about ESRI practices. Um, it was also myself learning. So um, they would ask really good questions. I would recognize gaps in my knowledge and be able to enhance my skills and knowledge there as well as enhancing theirs. So we could identify as a team forever on the job training sessions. It was also a really nice way to build team trust. Um, and it's great because now six or seven months later, communication is now both ways. So we can trust each other to um, ask questions and not worry about anything being too silly. And we also have the shared product ownership and responsibility along with a, a really nice strong team bond where we can just chat about anything, um, including coffee and one of the new team's members puppies, which um, is just really, really nice. On a personal level, um, I have learned that individually, no matter what your level is within the company, it is possible to individually make positive cultural change. And that feels quite empowering to recognize that you've made a difference on somebody's learning and development. You realize how far you've come on your own journey um, and it keeps imposter syndrome at bay. And that, yeah, confidence can be grown from many avenues not just technical ability, but um, also being able to help and mentor and support teams. And yeah, with that, I think I might have already gone over a little bit. Um, I admit I'm an introvert. And um, again, I realize I can talk for quite a long time. So on that note, I am going to finish that there. And uh, thank you all for, for listening. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rachel. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's it's so interesting. The mentoring space is is something we've had so much. Um, we've done uh, like quite a bit in, and everyone always says like you sign up to be a mentor, but you end up learning 
more yourself and learning all this stuff yourself. So yeah, it's interesting to hear, hear that at the end. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for Rachel? Carly, I can see you're nodding away there. I did have one actually. Um, I wanted to ask if there was any tools in particular you found helpful for like the collaboration portion of things, just because I've had a very similar experience with a new grad joining recently. And one of the things that we found was we just have to kind of get all on a Zoom call and do kind of like a, a trio review or a mob review. And that was really helpful. But I wondered if you had any other tools that you found useful. Cool. Yeah, we're, um, we're we're pretty similar. We were just using Teams for the most part and and screen sharing. We um we did use IntelliJ's um, Code with Me new functionality that came out last summer. Um, although I think when we started using it, it was still very early days. So we found between the three of us that it worked perfectly for one person. It was very laggy for the other and I think just didn't update at all for, for the other. Um, but that was extremely early days. I think that was the day it was released. And um, yeah, I certainly had very bad internet connection. So that probably um, caused some problems there. But uh, the premise was really good. And um, yeah, I think we might try that again. But otherwise, yeah, just the same as you, Carly, just um, screen sharing and talking over it through there. Amazing, cool, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Rachel, thanks, Carly. Um, so feel, feel, oh, sorry, Andrea, did you have- Do I have time for one more question? Uh, do you want, maybe at the end, can we save it to the okay. end? Um, yeah. Or feel free to pop it through with just one minute to go until the next one coming in, sorry. Um, uh, so um, I was gonna say one thing that, um, that would be great is, is to leave feedback. So feedback is always so, so useful um, for new speakers. Um, if there's anything that you particularly enjoyed, um, then let us know. Uh, so Dom, if you could pop that form down on the chat there, um, we've got a link. Um, but yeah, it's just so good when you first get started, just to kind of, you sit there, you give a talk and you've no idea, did that, was that helpful? Did it, you know, anything useful in that? And, and so often when there's those little nuggets that, that, um, that have helped you and, and, and done anything, just to get something like that back is, is really, really good. Um, so anyone uh, is happy to leave feedback, please, please do. Um, but thanks, Rachel, appreciate that. Um, and now we are up with Alex. So Alex, feel free whenever you're ready. Can everybody see that? Yeah, great, thanks very much, folks. So um, straight in there. So if you're an IT worker, uh, working in a company that does uh, any sort of uh, work for the UK public bodies, the UK government, then the chances are that you'll be asked to help uh, with a bid placed on the government digital marketplace. Um, so this is a very short talk um, to try and give you the basics so that you're prepared. So what is the marketplace? Well, um, it, it, it's fairly obvious. Um, rather than you turning up and selling your products, um, it's, it's rather a place where bodies in the UK public sector can place their own projects, their own requirements, and then companies come along and um, uh, basically say, yes, I, I have the capabilities, I can do that. So um, why you? I, I assume that you're almost all, all techies. Uh, why do you care? What, you're not in the marketing or sales team. And the fundamental problem here is that the digital marketplace requires uh, companies to put in lots of statements about your own capabilities, including things that you've probably done, projects that you've done in the past. And so uh, what, what we're talking about here is being able to provide evidence of those projects that have already happened. So here's a, the, the first uh, screen that you'll see when logging in. Um, typically, your uh, company will have created an account um, and created one for you. Um, the, there are lots of uh, things that public bodies actually uh, use the marketplace to, to find. Um, I'm mostly interested in this digital outcomes, um, which basically means somebody's actually what writing some software. So straight off, how do you use it? Um, it's a, it's a typical search system, um, 4,091 opportunities. That's way too much. Um, and then I realized I uh, needed to filter it a bit more. Great, okay, so I'm interested in big data. Let's filter it on that. 89 opportunities. That's, uh, this is from a few days ago. 
Um, and then I realized that uh, even that's too much. Um, and I should have filtered by the open opportunities. That comes down to just two, great. Um, some of these you'll see are whole teams of people. Some of them are just one, one uh, individual. Um, let's look for something else. So I work with a bunch of uh, uh, IT architects and enterprise architects. So let's look for architecture. Found this one, uh, architecture services support, or rather uh, one of my colleagues found it. Um, and I've been helping out uh, with this over the last week or so. Um, it's actually due today on the 19th of March. So any information that I give you, um, it is actually confidential, but you've only got a few hours to make use of it. So um, I doubt you're actually gonna put together a, a bid for this in the next few hours. So first thing of course, is to read all the information given to you uh, because there is a lot there, it's all useful. Um, they, they talk about what the project is, how much money they're expecting to pay, um, what they're expecting to get for it, why, the, and as you see, why the work is done. I'm not gonna go through all of it, there, there's quite a lot of it. Um, and if you don't know um, uh, what they mean by something, you can ask a question and they will uh, re respond. The important thing to realize is that all the suppliers get to see the answers. So uh, what about you? The important thing is that you're filling in information about your firm's skills and experience, which typically may mean your own skills. So an example question here, demonstrate ability to provide analysis of emerging trends for all domains, for senior management to inform future strategy. This is architecture, remember, uh, including the methodology and criteria used for the outcomes of assessments. Great. And you've got 100 words to answer this. Here was my, um, so the website will give you very good ideas of how to um, uh, structure your answers. Um, the important thing to realize here is that you want to say the situation you did, the work you did, and what the results were. Uh, there's an example on the website, but I was gonna give you my one. I think I'm running short of time, so I'm not gonna actually read out the whole thing. Um, and, uh, but the important thing to realize here is that, yes, I've put in the uh, situation. Well, we had a UK police body that needed data science and big data services. Uh, and then what I did is that I produced a report um, and then the outcome, well, I'm not very happy about this because the outcomes, well, we don't know if it actually worked or not. So um, what next? Starting uh, in this particular uh, project, there's about 40, 40 plus people, organizations actually applying for this work. And um, typically there'll be a short list later on where there's further processes for do it, doing uh, further proposals. And uh, that's a bit more flexible and you may or may not be involved in that. So um, here's what's the final message. It's be prepared. Um, I would suggest that you might go back to every project you've done and think about how would you write that project in 100 words? What was the situation? What did you do? What were the results? And, and importantly, how were they measured? So thank you very much. That's my talk today. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Um, again, your talks are always so so different, so varied and, and, and work with slides so, so I don't want to bore well. people. I am. Um, <laughs> No, no, no it's, it's awesome. It's good. It's it's um it's a good range. I think it's it's so such a good message. Like obviously coming from recruitment background, we we tend to see when people first start looking for work, they don't get every job that they apply for, and then after a few interviews, they get in the habit of it and they get become used to talking about their projects and and familiar with how to get that information. It's trying to show everything that you know, isn't it? It's, it's very difficult to do. Um, Absolutely, and and I I hope that um the people listening today are people who are keen to actually write about the right stuff. So hopefully this is perhaps more relevant than, than the straight coders, um, mm. but we will see. Does, uh, does anyone have any, any questions on that for Alex? Uh, feel free to just- Hi, I have. Yep. Hello, Andrea. Hi, how are you? Great talk. Thank you, Alex. It's funny because I have been thinking about this, you know, um, how, how to put in words my accomplishments, you know, because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I have the impression like 
have you ever worked in something important that I can talk about and explain? Of course I did, but I don't know if this happened with other people or just me, you know? How do you actually get aware and, and get to write about this? Because it's hard for me. I work so hard, you know, I feel tired, I do so many things, but how do I explain the importance of, of this? It's well, the, hard, isn't it? It is, it is very hard. And, and there's, there's two things to, to remember here. Uh, one is that the audience reading it is gonna expect your answers in different ways. So this situation, task, res results is how they, this particular, the government digital marketplace wants to receive that. Um, CVs, uh, resumes have a slightly different format, but it's it's similar. Um, and if you're doing, say, publicity material for your own company, then you might be doing something else as well. Um, so, I, I, it's, but it's also practice. It's practice, practice, practice. So, good luck with that. Hi, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Can I ask a quick, oh, a quick question ahead. about this as well? Um, so, I mean. Do they like have like, um, or is there like an opportunity for somebody who's just starting out, you know, to maybe to um, have like um, a smaller project or something which is small to get your, you know, to start out with, or is it usually like these big massive projects or which some of us might feel like, um, oh, can't really do that. That's a very good question. Um, there is a certain amount of hoops you've got to go through to in order to be registered in the first place. And I don't know all the details of that. So if you are perhaps a one person company, it may be too, too much hassle for you to do that. Um, I, I'd suggest maybe grouping together with a, 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 with a number of other people um, to register as a whole. And then people can then um, search for the, the actual individual projects as they come up. Don't know if that don't know if that helps. Yeah, that's thanks. Okay, Barry. I pass yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, uh, and thanks, George and Andrea. Um, so, as Dom's asked there, if anyone is happy to share feedback, please do. I know you've had loads coming through already, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so, next up, we have um, a guy from last week, Tom Calls. Tom, are you out there? Yes. Welcome back. Hello, my camera is working this time, so should be better than last time. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, great, then I'll just start. So hello everyone, I'm Tom, I'm from Belgium. Uh, I am very bad at time zones as evident by last time, uh, but this time I'm on time. So I wanted to share something with you for real this time. So uh, thanks everyone for coming back if you saw me last time. Uh, what you should know about me is that I'm a big gamer. I still am. Uh, that's actually the reason why I got into programming to develop games. Turns out to be a bit more difficult than I expected, but I learned to program in the end. So uh, recently I've decided to build my own kind of little games. So what I've been working on is kind of this one. It's sort of a flappy bird clone where if you click, it, it makes a little jump and you have gravity that pulls it down and so on. Is there anyone I've asked this question last time. Is there anyone who knows who this little figure is? Feel free to just unmute yourself and yell it out if you know. It's Totoro. It's a Totoro, thank you. Finally, someone. Uh, so it's a, a Totoro. And while I was building this game, well, after a while I got like, I wanna do the next thing. I've learned how to make like a basic game in, in, in JavaScript. It's not much of a game, but I could turn this into a game. And then I was thinking, how can I improve this? And then I thought, but hey, uh, I have this. <laughs> I have a big fluffy Totoro right here. So then I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually control the game using my real plush animal? And turns out that vision and machine learning to do those kind of things is actually pretty difficult. You need a lot of test files and so on. But then I found this uh, tool, the Teachable Machine, and I'll actually zoom out because I'm already I'm kind of trapped in a website now, you see, stuck. Uh, but what the Teachable Machine actually does is it makes it really easy for you to start uh, building a, machine, a vision project with machine learning. So first I needed to figure out how can I make this plush animal like interact with what I have in the, in the game because basically all it does is, is do a jump. And then I was thinking, you know, it, it, 
it, it doesn't really look like a bird, but maybe the best way to, to emulate something is, is to make them flap. See, arms open, arms closed. So the transition from open arms to closed arms, that could be a flap and then it could jump up in my game. So that actually means that I need to be able to recognize two things. I need to be able to recognize open arms and I need to be rec uh, able to recognize closed arms. So that's what we're going to do here. So the teachable machine is actually uh, just a simple way to create a machine learning model. So it means I need a class with open arms and I need a class with closed arms. So these are the two types of states that I want to recognize. And now I need to give it some examples. So the machine actually knows what do I mean when I say it's open and what do I mean when I say it's closed. So uh, time for a recording session. I hope my buddy's up for it today. So I'm just going to record open arms for six seconds. Make it spin a bit. So it recognizes different things. Here. So now I have a sample set of 151 images that he created in six seconds to try to recognize open arms. Let's do the same with closed arms. So, okay, recording six seconds. Try to get some diversity by shaking him around, turning a bit. Here. So now I have the two sets of, of test images and now I can train the model. So now it will use those images. My, the camera will freeze here, don't worry about it. I can use these two image sets to actually train and prepare a machine learning model. Uh, this all happens in JavaScript in the browser. So I don't actually need to spin up Python. I can just work with a simple JavaScript. It's training, training, training. You know how machine learning normally takes like days or hours to train a model? Well, da, 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 we're there. So hi, I'm back. So let's see if it actually works. So now you can see the input image we have here and you can see the output. So that's the probability. And he thinks now that my buddy has the arms closed. So I'm going to just pull them up gently. Let's see. And you can see it starts reacting. And hopefully, oh, there we go. Oh, closed, open, closed, open. It's not perfect, but it's good enough for a first trial run. Now, the really great thing about this uh, teachable machine is this button, the export model. Because if you're really bad at JavaScript and HTML, it actually gives you all the example code you need to run it. And it also has this nice button, upload my model, and then it just pushes the model it created to the cloud. And then I have my code of my own project I was working on. I've, I had it prepared, of course. Uh, let's see, I'm going to unhide the video and I will load it in the classifier. So this code is basically what was in here, but then in uh, with, a, with a bit more visual code to, to let my game work. Uh, and then here is the big one. So basically it does a detection with the algorithm and it gets a result. And based on the result, it gets a state, either it's open and close, uh, open or closed. And when the st current state is open and the new state is closed, it means that it, he flapped his little arms and then I trigger a jump in the game. So what that looks like if I run this and things do not collapse on me like last time, it means that, um, let me just, oh, errors, that's always convenient. So it's saying it's closed at the moment. So let's see if he wants to, no. Oh, it's not working as perfectly as I'd hoped. Oh, it actually is working. I just accidentally triggered it too many times and then it jumps all the way to the top uh, out into infinity, which isn't what I expected it to do. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Ignore the errors. It's all fine. So closed. Let's see. Open. Yeah, it's not. Uh, luckily, uh, I have a video for you to see it more clearly. So when it when you train it a bit better, it actually looks like this. And 
and off he goes. So this is what I wanted to show you today. The Teachable Machine is actually a really fun way to build machine learning projects with your kids, which is something that would be almost impossible to do otherwise. So I hope that you do something with this. And if you do something with this, feel free to reach out because I'm always curious to see what other people do with the crazy tools I find and talk about. So that was my talk, Teachable Machine. Hope you enjoyed. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate that. Um, I can't believe how much you managed to get through in seven minutes. That was, um, yeah, very impressive. Um, did anyone have any any questions for Tom on the talk or anything anything there? Feel free to just unmute and uh, and speak. Um, I was just wondering if we could do some sort of workshop on this. I'd love I that. That would be, I think this is really cool. So yeah. I would love to play around with it. If a workshop is on the cards, that would be awesome. Yeah, I don't know. Is it, Tom, is it realistic to think you could do a workshop virtually? The, I can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Tom, putting people on the spot. I like, just book a date, just book a date. I like it. No, I think um, it's great. I think, yeah, like, I'm not techie at all. And I was like, wow, could I do this? Yeah. I feel like maybe yeah. I could, actually, I the, te the, the teachable machine has like three options. I took the the open project, so you can detect everything that you want. You just need to train it a bit more better. Uh, but it also has audio training, so you basically feed it to sort of audios, and then it can also recognize, for example, the difference between heavy metal music and classical music. It could you could train it on that as well. And the third one is actually a post project, so it actually detects where your head is, where your shoulders are how you move, and then you can uh, do detections based on that. So we could, as a workshop, build a fitness app that automatically checks if you're doing your squats correctly or if count your push-ups or, or, or something more sedimentary for <laughs> the IT people. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome, though. Yeah, Come, yeah. Let's, let's pick that up. That does sound like something we should be doing. That right. looked a, a lot of fun. I'll Thanks, drop Tom. the link to the repo with all the code in the, in the chat. Real. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, Pavel, are you there? Are you out there? Hi there. Yeah, yeah, just like my screen. Uh, yeah. Very cool. good timing. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks for joining us then. And I will I'll hand over to you. So you're, you're good to go whenever you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. I, um, I'm going to use this text mate to do my presentation. Um, um, so, hi, I'm Paul Badensky, and I'm a CTO at Startup Pricey Monkey. And if you want to reach me, reach out um, for anything after or about this talk, please ping me on this email. Um, so, it's going to be a talk about exceptions. Um, and I used to be a, I'm a mostly JavaScript for the past five years. I used to be a Java programmer for many years. And so, I decided to go with a slightly cheeky uh, title. Um, uh, I'm a JavaScript programmer and I don't use exceptions. Um, so what's um, what's wrong with exceptions? So there's um, there's really two things why why I don't like them. Um, first of all, there are really a faulty construct, um, and the if you think about it, exceptions are really a go-to equivalent. So they're a legacy of go-to. So everybody we, we removed go-to. Go-to was bad but exception state, so they are a go-to equivalent. Um, so basically that allows you to jump around the stack and go from teleport from one place of the code to another. Um, and that's that's not good, obviously, as we all know. Um, and the second reason they're actually even worse, so redundant. So let me just cover through these two points now. So first of all, why do I think they're a faulty construct? I think this should be relatively, um, already know to, to some people, but um, I can write things like this in my code. And I'd be using a uh, some sort of um, a monster between Java and JavaScript um, as a syntax. So if I have three functions here, function one, function two, and function three, and then I catch an, except, catch an exception, and then I'm doing something here. And basically, now the question is like, which method through an exception any of these methods could have thrown an exception if I got one. 
um, none of them, um, or um, it wasn't the method that threw an exception, but a method that a method called. So basically, there's so many combinations here. Um, I can put in the strike catch in that scope. I can put methods that do throw do throw these exceptions, or I can put methods that do not. Some of them. So it's basically a bit of a mess. So you can do you can do that with exceptions, which creates a very difficult to understand code. Um, and you can throw exceptions from one place in the code and then catch it somewhere down the stack in different place, basically to creating this teleporta teleportation device, which is equivalent to, to go to. Um, so that's for why um, exceptions are the construct. Exceptions promote sloppy code and they lack rigor. So now to off to the second bit about redundancy. Uh, why are exceptions redundant? Exceptions are redundant because in a function, I can say this, and I can throw an exception. But uh, so what does, that, what does that do? It's a bit of going back to fundamentals and very kind of basic explanation. That returns an invalid state in the code. So what if I do this? Oh, that actually returns a valid state in the code. So I have two syntaxes. For, for kind of saying the same thing, one of them is um, giving back the correct state in the code to the receiver, and one of them is giving them the invalid state of the code. So if I uh, use the return, I would then say const x equals function, and that basically gives back the state of the code to the main thread and assigns it to a variable. So that's all great. Um, and that's very easy to reason about because I can only call one function. I know which variable is going to get assigned. There's no ambiguity here. And you can see that the relaxation of these rules for a try catch basically creates this. Anybody can do anything a wild, wild, wild west. So what do functional programming programmers do? So what functional programmers do, they use the simpler construct, which is return, and model both behaviors. So they would do something like this. If successful, Turn. I'm going to be using a bit of a cryptic thing here to, to invite you to uh, research and Google about this more. This is kind of I'm, I'm going to the point where like I'm going to say this is outside of the part of the presentation. If you not know more, <laughs> um, um, Google. Um, so if it's successful, I return a successful type. But if it's unsuccessful, I say return the unsuccessful result, which is going to be my error. And so I'm basically using the simpler syntax, which is return, to capture both modes of behavior, a, a successful and successful returning of state from functions. So in summary, um, in our project, we don't use exceptions. Instead, we use functional programming. And specifically, if you're interested, we use a library, JavaScript li library called FPTS. We actually do use TypeScript in our code, but that's a um, uh, which is subset of a uh, type subset of JavaScript. Um, exceptions are redundant because they can be modeled through a return statement. And you don't need them. Um, you're better off using uh, you're better off using a simpler construct return. And under, and the last thing is you'll end up with easier, uh, more maintainable code that's easier to reason about. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Brilliant, thank you very much, Pavel. I do think that the uh, the presentations are getting more and more creative. In uh, it used to just be slides, and and now it's it's all sorts of different different things with visuals and and videos and and all sorts. And and now, um, yeah, just just written out. It's good. It's interesting. Um, did did anyone have any questions for for Pavel on on this? Again, feel free just to unmute and ask away. Hey, uh, Pavel, um, I got a question. What would you say if if I said that exceptions are syntactical sugar in the sense that it's a shortcut? So if you you know in your example with the return my uh, error value or proper value. Um, 
you have to do that everywhere, right? So if you only care about something at the upper level, then you pass your exceptions, you know, kind of like a checked exception, you pass it up the stack, you know, five times. Whereas with if you throw an um, unchecked exception, you know, you only have to worry about that at the place you care about, which is the outer loop. Um, um, yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. Um, actually, if you use, um, we do use uh, um, monadic syntax and we do use monads um, in our code. And if you use monads, you actually, uh, so do check it out, do check it out how to manage this with monadic uh, syntax and monads because you can actually um, go, um, um, Flow, uh, flow those return types for your system without actually without worrying about handling um, the uh, exception type. It's almost transparent. There's little syntax uh, sugar on top, but it's almost transparent. Um, so you can actually you can actually write it quite easy using monads. Exceptions are a shortcut. My colleague colleague at my project uses the term escape hatch, and I really like it. And it's a bit of escape hatch and um, for us in our project, I, the consequences and the cost, the complexity of exceptions, just we decided it's not it's not worth the trouble. It's sort okay. of like static typing, dynamic typing. Dynamic typing, a lot of things are easier to express. Um, and static typing, you have to be more rigorous. Uh, but then you know you pay a bit of a price for um, easier to maintain code. So it's questions like when, where, where are your trade offs? I would say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Carsten. Thanks, Pavel. I had a funny feeling that that might open a bit of a can of worms there. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for the question and thank you, Pavel, for the presentation. Thank okay, you. so our our final uh, our final presentation this afternoon then. Um, Stephen, are you, are you ready? You're set? You're good to share? I am ready. Go. And here we go. Is Can everyone see this? Brilliant. So, Hello everyone and welcome to my new project. It's been on my mind for a while and it's called the Untechnical Programmer. And it's basically born that I remember at the beginning of my career, uh, I tried reading a load of technical books and I just couldn't learn. And I felt very silly about it and it upset me uh, because I felt that I was stupid. And I realized over time that that's not really necessarily the case. And so I wanted to start up a project that supports people like me who have difficulty learning effectively from technical books and talk documentation, or at least they do so in the first instance. And this all started with this chap. Some people might know him. He's John Somnes, and he's written a load of books, and he's got a blog, and he's got all kinds of things. And this book, which is a bit of a tome, is really, really good. Uh, apart from the fact that he seems to want to get the fact that he's a male model into it several times, which uh, mm, not quite on topic, but yes, it's still a very good book with loads of good content. And one of the number one things that he says about your career is to start a blog. So I thought to myself, I'm going to do that. And as soon as I get some time on my hands, I'm going to start thinking about that. So I decided to do that, but then I thought, you know what, well, there's quite a few blogs, and I'm not saying that there's not a place for more, but maybe I wanted to do something a bit different, a bit more modern. So I took a little bit of a different approach, and I've decided to do the ex the untechnical programmer on TikTok. And this is often because People's attention spans are not necessarily several minutes long. It's something maybe that people have got to learn. It's people. It's something that people have got to exercise those muscles. And for things to be approachable, they need a really quick, easy way of just understanding the basics of what something is, or whether it's big or whether it's small. And maybe they want some encouragement along the line as well. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And you can Google some of the simplest things to do with software engineering and computer science and to get back a very non-readable, non-normal English answer. So to combat this, to combat this problem with having to think technically and not being so used to doing so, I made reference in my first video introducing this, which will be live in a, the next day or two, the fact that I've read or tried to read this book this book, this book, this book, and this book. It quite 
you know, with quite some difficulty and to be absolutely honest, very, very little success. Read plenty of articles and blogs too that haven't made sense. Read plenty of code that is far more complicated than it actually needs to be to get across the point. So these are my first words in my first episode. Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode, episode zero of the Untechnical Programmer. This is a channel for all coders, especially ones like me who find technical books and documentation really hard to use. My next episode after that is going to be why Docker is useful. And my next after that is why software development is hard and specifically how to deal with some of the odd effects that come across when you have such a huge volume of stuff to learn. And it's not just the amount of volume, it's the stuff that it is impossible for a newbie to prioritize what they need to remember and what they just need to understand. And that is a big, big difference. So I will leave my short talk introducing my new projects with the last words from my first video. And that is, don't give up, don't lose heart, and ignore anyone that tells or suggests that you have to learn like them. I hope I can help. And thank you very much, everyone. That is my talk. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. Not at all what I was expecting, but but yeah, very interesting. Um, does uh, does anyone have any questions for, for Stephen? Or are you all just going to go and sign up for the Untechnical Programmer and find the answers there? I'm tempted to get TikTok just so I can see what the video is. <laughs> um... <laughs> Steve, does does have... anyone else do, do you do you have TikTok at the moment? Oh, you say you're, you're tempted. No, to get I don't. I don't have it at the moment. Um, but I've been tempted because there's a couple of people doing stuff on TikTok, and I was actually having a good chat with Helen a couple of weeks ago about different content types, and that was a an idea that she had. So I'm very interested to see what Stephen has done. I guess Stephen, do you have any tips on if someone was going to do something similar? in terms of duration or types of content that you found might be more suitable compared to for TikTok compared to like a blog, for example? To be absolutely honest, I'm very new to this. I mean, I had a stress last night because I couldn't work out the best way to add subtitles and things are a little bit late because I thought, oh, I better add subtitles. So this isn't quite launched yet, uh, but it will be over the next couple of days. But I wouldn't be able to offer a huge amount of advice because I'm really, really new to it. Um, you can never say as much as you want to in a minute, but in a way, that's a good thing. Cool. So you'll be coming back to tell us all about what worked and how it went then? Possibly. Yeah, that'd be lovely. That'd be good. I'd love to hear about it. Mark, thank uh, Mark, um, I can see you've, you've yeah. got your, um, your, your hand up as well. And um, did you, do you have something to add there? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, have you ever come across any documentation that you found particularly approachable that just worked for you and you were able to uh, look at a new API and, you know, it just sort of, it just made sense and you were able to make use of it. So I just wondered what you thought were the qualities of good documentation. Well, uh, it's a bit of a tricky thing. If we're talking about all the resources that are available, the things that I found most useful is a tutorial maker called Mosh Hamadani who works under the, the title Code with Mosh. I find him particularly useful. Um, mm. I will say that there's a particular caveat that I've got that there's some great platforms out there like the Free Code Camp courses and Code Academy, which are really good in that they're interactive. But I've experienced, and I've heard from an awful lot of people that I've tutored or mentored that whilst they're very approachable, the information tends to go out of your head really quickly. So it's always really good to apply it in the context of doing a project. And I, I think that applies to most people. Um, uh, but a, a specific documentation, not particularly. But uh, that doesn't mean that, that it's all bad. It's just that none comes immediately to mind. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting, you know, because I'm sort of very much involved with um, the creation of technical documentation for my product, and I often wondered myself, how, how easy is that to read? Is that, does that really help people? But um, yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm quite up, if you want to connect, Mark, I'm quite up for contributing or helping. 
I might contact uh, Alex, you. I Thank you. you had, please, please do, Mark. Alex, you had your hand up as well? Yeah, Stephen, uh, hopefully this is a quick question. Um, so I, I've also been thinking about doing um, videos um, explaining concepts that are very short, but I kind of thought of doing it for YouTube uh, because I think more of my audience would be on YouTube. Did you, did you consider YouTube and reject it for some reason or? Um, Funnily yeah. enough, I went, I went straight because I use TikTok for, I'm, I'm not going to say non-typical because it's a, it's a very, very wide ranging platform. But I think TikTok is most famous for quite casual things like dancing and following trends and stuff like that. But there are some very, very good uh, environmental, political uh, and science and learning based profiles on there, which I really enjoy that one. I was just flicking through all night and I was just saying, why not? It's, you know, it's, it's one of those things I could investigate it forever, what, whether to do this, that and the other. And then I just thought, oh, just do something, just do it. Which is very, very much as I think. And I don't know if that actually links that facet of my, how I do things links into my lack of ability with technical documentation is that I just tend to do things. I don't think about them much, I just do them. And then, and I think, that, I think that's quite nice for software development because software development isn't a do it once and it has to work type of thing. You can go back constantly to your code to work on it. So, but sorry, to answer your question, I digress. Um, YouTube has been the second thought for me, but to be absolutely honest, because the videos for TikTok have to be in a portrait 16.9, times one nine two zero resolution, it would actually take a lot of time for me to convert them to the other YouTube, to the YouTube landscape. And that would actually take me quite a lot of time. There's probably a quick way to do it. So anyway, any video editors, please do tell me if there's a very quick converter. Um, I think it may be something for the future, certainly. But I'm, I'm happy to talk about that with you at any time. Cheers, thanks very much. You gotta watch you don't go viral now, Stephen. Oh, don't don't say that to me, Barry. I'm not I'm not even thinking about that. It's just terrifying. <laughs> no, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. I've not I've not I obviously know a lot of people that use TikTok, but I don't think I've I've seen anyone that's creating TikTok content or that's um uh, that's gone crazy with it. So yeah, have we got anyone else out there that's on here today um that, that's got experience that's that's putting stuff out there on TikTok? No. No. Oh, you have to, as uh, as I said, you have to come back and, and let us know how um, how it goes. Um, Will do. Yeah. And um, if once it's up and running, I can distribute the link on the record people that listen today. That would be fantastic. I'm sorry I couldn't stick a link up on screen today, but you know, life and work got in the way. <laughs> um, speaking of which, actually, if if everyone that has given a, a talk wants to um, have once the is open to being contacted afterwards, feel free to put your, your details in the chat um, and people can either look you up on LinkedIn or Twitter or, um, or, or wherever you, um, you like to be contacted. Um, there's often people sitting there with questions that they didn't get around to asking. Um, and it's always, uh, it's always good to, just to have that right. If, I'm, if, if, you've, if you've scratched a bit of an itch there, but, but I wanna know more, where, where can I go? What should I read next? What blog post should I, should I look at next? Um, so yeah, thank you. Just seeing those all coming through. Um, so what comes next? So is anybody out there that has watched, is anyone interested in potentially speaking at an upcoming uh, Lightning Talks event? Um, Mark, I can see on screen, I know you talked about you, you've got a project there. Is it, is it something you might like to do, do you think? Um, Mark Baird, I'm looking at you. Not, not yet. I may, I may come yet. back to you when it's in a, in a, fit, in a fitter state for presenting. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Well, we're open, always open. Anything that you've got to say, you can see from, um, from the presentations today, um, there is a true range in, in, in what people talk about. And every week we get, get things all over the spectrum. Um, so, so, yeah. Any, anybody else, anybody that, that might want to talk at, at a future event? It's all gone quiet. This is usually what happens. I think they're all thinking about longer talks now, Barry. 
It must be that. It yeah, must be that. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe. <laughs> well, listen, the, the, offer is, the offer is there and it's always open. We do this every two weeks. Um, the, the idea came about uh, from us trying to just give this opportunity for people to, to dip a toe in the water or give their first step um, on a potential uh, speaking career. Um, like as, as I said at the beginning for anybody that was here um, with Robert in the, in the early days, like 12, 13 years ago, we, we've seen so many speakers now come through, um, give their first presentation at, at one of our Lightning Talks events or at an LJC event or at the Open Conference, and then go on to have just a ridiculous speaking career. Um, many of the people that are now keynoting uh, some of the Java conferences gave initial presentations as a Lightning Talk, We've interviewed loads of them so we can share a lot of those interviews if, if anyone's interested. And everyone, like bar none, I think, has been exceptionally nervous, felt that they don't have much to talk about, usually been pushed hard into giving their first presentation. Um, and, and they've seen so many benefits in, in connecting with other people that are um, that are interested in the similar kind of things. Um, obviously there's there's career benefits and, and they'll get job offers and and, and things like that. Um, people might see you talking at an event and want to work at your company. So it's recruitment benefits. There's all sorts of benefits from, from getting involved. Um, so we're here. If anybody wants to get involved, speak to Dom, speak to myself. You find either of us on LinkedIn or, or any one of the 200 emails you've probably already had this week from us. Um, so come and see us and we'd love to get you here. Um, yeah. Anything else, Dom, that we need to say? Yeah, there isn't a lightning talks in two weeks because it's Good Friday. So it will be on the ninth instead, the week after, say so three week gap this time. But okay. otherwise we'll be back to normal on the ninth. Bro. Well, thank you everyone for, for tuning in then. Thank you especially to our speakers for, uh, for giving it a shot. And we'll see you then. We'll see you at the next one. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>